Hi guys, my name is Frank Chaparro, Senior Correspondent at The Block. You might know me as Frankie Scoops or Fintech Frank, but hopefully now you'll get to know me as the host of The Block's new podcast called The Scoop, made especially for decision makers and thrill seekers in the crypto market. Each week, I, along with one of my cohorts here at The Block, will talk with CEOs, innovators, and builders across the crypto market. Last week, we spoke with Mike Botson, CEO of DTCC, and today we welcome Mark Yusko, CIO of Hedge Fund Morgan Creek, which oversees the management of $5 billion and counts firms like Coinbase and BlockFi in its portfolio. Yusko has been a darling of the equities world since the 2000s, and in recent years has become one of Bitcoin's biggest proponents. To find out why Morgan Creek believes in Bitcoin, why some hedge funds don't, and why the equities markets are heading towards disaster in 2019, keep listening. Or keep listening to find out the origin story of Yusko's bromance with Anthony Pompliano. I'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one finance app in the App Store for almost two years. It was also the first major peer-to-peer payments app to start supporting Bitcoin, and it's still the fastest and easiest way to on-ramp fiat. No more waiting five days for your ACH payments to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. It's also a favorite of the block analyst, Steven Zhang. He uses Cash App when he goes to Chipotle and gets money back. He saves every time he eats a burrito. That keeps Steven happy, that keeps the block happy, and that keeps the crypto world informed with the best news and research in the entire market. You can also use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, Chipotle, as I said, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, and Dunkin' Donuts. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play. Here's Mateo Leibowitz and I with Yusko. So we are, I mean, I'm very excited for this podcast. I was, I was telling, I was telling Teo before we came down here that I, I, I really think that this thing is made by the guests who are, I don't know if they're, they're just gracious enough or, 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 you know, thrill seekers. Um, but I'm the weakest link. Teo's the weaker link. And we have the strongest link sitting next to me on my right. Mark Yusko, the Chief Investment Officer there you go. and CEO, right? Yes, both. Of Morgan Creek uh, Capital. Yeah, which, Morgan Creek Capital Management. Then we'll get to Morgan Creek Digital Assets here yeah, in a little bit. Which is just, so there's, it's basically a fund of funds. We were talking about the structure before we turned on the recording equipment. Um, Mark, thanks so much for coming down, or coming up rather. From coming Raleigh. up, yeah. Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, woke up in North Carolina and here I am. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us a bit about just what Morgan Creek is and, and how it all got started and uh, what you guys are investing in. Yeah, I'll give you the short version, although I'll warn you, I don't do short well, so I'll try to stay short. Please. But uh, So I grew up in the investment world. I worked for an insurance company and an asset manager, and then I, I got the call to go back to the alma mater. I went to Notre Dame back in 93, was the assistant investment officer there for five years, and then left to be the chief investment officer at University of North Carolina. Traditional asset allocation, manager selection, portfolio construction. We didn't really you know, make the direct investments. We allocated money to, to managers. I was approached by a couple of families back in 2004, left, formed a registered investment advisor called Morgan Creek Capital Management in 2004. We started managing money for individuals, wealthy families, family offices, smaller institutions that didn't have staff. And that morphed from advisory work to fund of funds work to hedge funds, private investments. And then about uh, five years ago, uh, kind of started to get sure. into the rabbit hole of, of crypto and, and uh, blockchain. And then a year and a half ago, we launched Morgan Creek Digital Assets, which is a subsidiary of Morgan Creek Capital Management. But it all started when you were at University of North Carolina. These yeah. families... How did they? How did they know of what you were doing? Ah, great, and, great question. Look, it's, it's it's interesting, right? Um, I went to North Carolina in 1998, and most people will not remember this, but in 1996, Julian Robertson, uh, who's a very famous UNC grad, famous hedge fund manager, ran Tiger Management, and he had a tough year in 1996, and they wrote an article in Business Week called "The Fall of the Wizard," and he was down nine percent. The market was up five percent. And so North Carolina banned hedge funds, right? The board of North Carolina banned hedge funds. So I show up in 1998 
And I said, well, you know, the best managers in the world manage these hedge funds, people like Julian and others, I want to invest there. I'm like, oh, well, we banned hedge funds. I'm like, all right, fine. We won't have any hedge funds. We'll have long, short equity, opportunistic equity, enhanced fixed income, and absolute return. And the chancellor says, well, that's just nomenclature, right? I said, yeah. He says, good, as long as we're clear. So we <laughs> did, over the next two years leading up to the Y2K, move to about 40 plus percent in hedge funds, about 20 percent in private. And so from 2000 to 2002, when the average foundation endowment lost about a quarter of their assets, when the market crashed in 2000, 2001, 2002, we were flat. And so people heard about that. And also, I became known, it's kind of funny, uh, someone called me the Madonna of hedge funds. Because I was out there preaching hedge you don't funds. Look like I don't look like Madonna. I don't sound like Madonna. I don't sing like Madonna. She's way more buff than I am. But I was out on the dais speaking at conferences saying, you can't just be in stocks, bonds, and cash. You've got to be in alternative investments. You've got to be in hedge funds. The talent is migrating from the traditional world to hedge funds, and you've got to go there. So- I had it's that interesting. And there's almost a parallel, right? Oh, Between, there's a parallel. Oh, coming. for sure. About yeah. then in 2000, 2001, you were telling everybody, this is where you need to be an investor. Yeah. Well, and it's where it is even more parallel. Back then, first time, 1996, we go to our board at, at Notre Dame before I went to UNC, said, we want to invest in hedge funds. We want to invest in this guy, Julian Robertson and Danny Ock and, and his group and Richard Perry. And they're like, no, that's where all the bad guys are. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're fiduciaries. We can't possibly invest in hedge funds. So how do you convince Those are them? risky. Well, we just show them the data, mm -hmm. right? Data doesn't lie. And unless my boss, you're in crypto. Well, yeah, unless you're in crypto. But my, yeah, right, right. We can talk about that. So my, one of my early bosses said, figures lie and liars figure. And, but the data, the actual data doesn't lie. And so what's interesting about Markowitz theory, right? Harry Markowitz won the Nobel Prize. And he said, if you take bonds and you add stocks, risk goes down. If you add real estate and hedge funds, risk goes down. Everybody's like, no, that can't, be, that can't be right. Well, he won the Nobel Prize. It's right. And so we showed them the data, both at Notre Dame and then again at, at UNC. And the proof in the pudding's in the eating, right? Our results spoke for themselves. You know, we had really good results as we increased our allocation. And it, it makes sense. In what business do you know? Does the best person not charge the most money? Doctor, lawyer, football coach, basketball player, same thing with asset management. The worst people are going to stay managing index funds because it pays the least, and the best are going to go run where they can get two and 20. And so we saw this migration of talent, and we followed the talent, followed the money, followed the talent, and we allocated capital there, and, and it worked. So, but it's very similar to today in that. Back then, nobody wanted to do hedge funds. They were afraid of hedge funds. Like I said, UNC had banned hedge funds. That's where all the evil, dark-sided people were. And, oh, you're not American if you short stocks. I'm like, no, it's really American to tell people to buy stuff that's egregiously overvalued that's going to go down. Yeah, that's really American. No, what's American is calling out frauds and fads and, and phonies and all the, the overvalued assets. That, that would, that's what a good hedge fund manager does. So we made those changes. That worked out. So fast forward to today. Where are all the bad guys? In crypto. In crypto. And so trying to convince people to go in that direction. What's interesting is I have this partner. I think you've had him on the show or will have him on the show, but Anthony Pompliano or Pomp as everybody knows him. He's got his own podcast mm -hmm. and all this good stuff. But he and I met two years ago through an investment in Lyft. And we we're both making late stage uh, venture investments. We also do early stage. He did some early stage stuff, something called Full Tilt Capital. And we met. And I didn't spend much time together. We met, we did this investment, great. About six months later, uh, I start following this guy on Twitter. And it turns out it's Pomp. And I'm like, 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 like everything he said, I either would have come out of my mouth or I'd said it or I'm like, I got to meet this guy. So I got to find out what the virus is all about. Exactly. If virus is spreading. So we sit down for breakfast, get together for breakfast next day. And then the next week. And then after a couple weeks, I, you know, we should work together. So he describes it best in the sense of, it sounds better when he says it, but if you take the two groups, right? Take the crypto kids, you know, they all wear black t-shirts and sit on the side of the river and they look across the other side and they look at the institutional old guys like me and say, don't look like them, don't like them, don't trust them. And the old guys in the institutional business look across the river and say, 
don't look like those guys, don't trust them, and they're not going to work together. But they're in the middle. There's four or five guys who've crossed the chasm. You know, John Burbank, Nova Gratz, Dan Moorhead, and this Yusko guy. And Pomp said, well, three of those guys are traitors. We don't want to be traitors. But this Yusko guy, he's actually managed billions of dollars. He's got infrastructure. He's got salespeople. He's got back office people. Maybe we could create this bridge across the river between the institutional capital and the people who have this knowledge about this emerging technology. But before you and Pomp sort of came together, had your meeting of the minds and identified these synergies yeah. between the two firms, uh, you had had your own crypto journey, right? Uh, you came crypto into contact journey, with Dan yes. Moorhead, the tiger management uh, sort of uh, mafia, so to speak. Yeah. And you had your own coming of age story with crypto from 2013 to when I guess you met Pomp maybe what, a year ago. When did the deal close? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we met in 20. Uh, 17, and then we really put Morgan Creek Digital together last year in 2018. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to your point, we all have a crypto journey. We all see the crypto light. And I, and I say what's interesting about this is everyone I know who's intelligent starts skeptical. That's the way you should start, right? With anything new, you should start skeptical. And then I call it ignorance displacement theory, right? You know, Archimedes um, uh, discovered this displacement principle by getting in the bathtub and boom, uh, the water displaced. And it's same thing with ignorance. We all start ignorant about something. And that doesn't mean in the negative connotation of it, it just means we don't have, have knowledge. But as we gain knowledge about something, anything, how to play golf, how to play poker, whatever it is, whether it's investing Ricky, in crypto. which we play sometimes. You ever play you Ricky? No, oh, no. See, I'm it. ignorant. So I would be the patsy, right? The old, if you're in a game for 20 minutes, you don't know who the patsy is, stop playing. <laughs> so... Uh, it's it's typically Teo. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. So we won't play. But um, I was ignorant. And so I met Dan Moorhead, who I had helped seed when he launched Pantera Macro, when he spun out of Tiger. I've known Dan 25 years. We've been investing with pretty much all the Tiger Cubs over the years in the hedge fund side. And we had a great relationship. And he, in 2013, said, hey, I'm shutting down the macro fund, sending your money back, and I'm going to do these two funds in crypto. And I, I don't even know what you're talking about, but tell me more. He says, well, there's this thing, Bitcoin, and we're going to start a Bitcoin fund, and the founders of Fortress are putting money in, and, and it's really interesting. And then I'm going to do this infrastructure fund to back companies that are going to help build that. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. I'm a picks and shovels guy. I like infrastructure. Okay, I'll do that. And that was the first of my many bad decisions in crypto because that fund's been great. It's about a 9.6x. We'd all say that's awesome. I should have put the money in the Bitcoin fund. That's like 86x, including the crypto winter. It's best performing hedge fund of all time. So fast forward another couple of years, I'm starting to think more about this. I wrote, actually it's just a year. I wrote, remember when uh, Bitcoin had bounced to a thousand and then it had dropped about mm -hmm. 400 first quarter of 14. I write these long quarterly letters. I mean, they're long, like 40, 50, 60. And my last one was 83 pages. And everyone said, why do you write such long letters? Like they're too hard to read. So they're not for you. They're for me. It's how I learn by writing. And it's how I, you know, get my views. And so I wrote one paragraph on Bitcoin in a 60-page letter. And I had clients say, we'll fire you if you don't start top, stop talking about this crazy stuff. How many? Pardon? How many clients? Oh, you know, half a dozen. I mean, half, half a dozen, dozen people called, literally took time out of their day. So that means how many people thought it. But half, people, half a dozen people called up and said, stop talking about this. This is crazy. We don't want to hear about Bitcoin. Now, that was at 400. Now, when I went from 400 to $1.75. So my ex-girlfriend used to say to me. Yeah. But it went to 175, and I'm like, okay, they were right. That was September that year. And then, boom, it goes all the way back to 1,000. So 2015, my son's graduating from Notre Dame, um, where we all went. And I said, go meet with Dan and just talk to some companies. And uh, he talked to a couple companies, Coinbase and a couple others. And, and he comes, and he said, I don't know, Dad. I, I, just, I really want to live in San Francisco, but I think I'm going to go with KPMG. Safe, easy. And I, okay, great, great decision. So we're having Thanksgiving dinner last year. And he's like, all right, fine, Dad. You were right. I should have gone with one of the crypto companies. But you're not as smart as you think you are. I'm like, oh, tell me why. He says, you didn't mortgage the house up and put it all in Bitcoin. I'm like, ah, touche. All right. Mm -hmm. So again, told you I made many bad decisions. But the, the key was I had this beginning of this relationship with the infrastructure side, invested in Coinbase and Zappo and a couple other infrastructure companies, Corbett good outcomes. 
then we started to dabble in, in crypto itself. And uh, that was kind of 2015, 16. And a couple of our clients, instead of saying they'd fire us, said, oh, this is interesting. Tell me more. And they did a little bit. And one of the good things, and we weren't as forceful. Now, is that through the hedge fund part of the business? Uh, in our, no, it was our private business side of the business. So we have private funds that do fund of funds. We have hedge funds of funds and a hedge fund. And so we did everything more in our private funds. And so what was the exposure to clients in terms what of- What we told people was we should do 1% in crypto itself because of the asymmetry of it. And then you should put another couple percent in infrastructure related to it. So a couple, two, 3%, not crazy allocations, but we thought the asymmetry was really high. And when you look at traditional assets today, um, one of our big themes right now is get off zero, hashtag get off mm -hmm. zero from, from uh, uh, Twitter. And the key is that zero, 10 years from now, you look back, it's going to be the wrong answer. As a fiduciary, no exposure to crypto assets is going to be the wrong answer. So it doesn't have to be 10 or 20 or 30% because the asymmetry is so large. So we started small, started to, to allocate. And that's when I had this, this meeting with with Anthony and a couple other people too, but but it was really that that meeting with Anthony 18 months ago where I went, yeah, this really needs it. So we started down the path of building what we call Morgan Creek um, Blockchain Opportunity Fund. So we had the documents, we're all ready to go. And Pomp and his partner, Jason Williams, had this thing called Full Tilt Capital. They're doing early stage investing, kind of professionalizing friends and family. And we got together and said, hey, let's merge We'll bring you guys on as the team to do the Blockchain Opportunity Fund, and we'll flip-flop our normal model. Our normal model was 70% funds, external managers, 30% co-investments. So we'll flip-flop it, and we'll go 70% in direct deals. We'll go 15, 1.5% in external managers. So we'll invest in a Pantera or a Blockchain Capital or something else. Uh, and then we'll do up to 15, 1.5% directly into crypto. And so we launched that. We went out to raise 25 million bucks. We actually were oversubscribed. We raised 40. But the big thing is we got institutions to come in. We got six institutions because most of the money so far has been high net worth individuals. But we got six institutions. And the big one for us is we got two public pension funds. And that was amazing because they're usually not early adopters, but we had two great CIOs, real leaders. Um, they both invested personally. Uh, we got to their boards and, and survived the board meeting ordeal. Uh, well, that's interesting. We could get into that, like what maybe yeah. the board meetings were like. But something that I was thinking about when that news came out, you know, two massive, I think it was the Fireman's Fund of, of Arlington. Yeah, Fairfax County. Fairfax yep. County, right. Um, to what degree is this something that's going to impact the, you know, the investment return of, of the folks that are investing for when it's just this massive fund that, at the end of the day, is only getting a limited amount of exposure. Is it that big of an ask so here, to convince them? It's a really good question, and a lot of people would say, no, if you only put you know half a percent or one percent, it can't move the needle. Not true. Venture capital. So in 1996, I was at Notre Dame, and we invested $5 million in this company, this venture capital company called Sequoia. Now, in 1996, mm -hmm. Sequoia was not famous. In fact, Michael Moritz hadn't even done a deal yet. He was a cub reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Don Valentine hired him over, and we backed him. Of that $5 million investment, they put half a million in this little company called Google, and we took out $200 million. There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. So you can have little tiny investments make a gigantic impact on the overall fund if they have the right asymmetry. You're never going to get a 400x return buying stocks in an index fund. You're never going to get a 400% return buying bonds or high yield bonds or even. But when a massive funds. pension fund is investing hundreds of millions of dollars, the point I'm I'm trying to get at is, do they really care if they're going to throw a couple? No, they absolutely small care. Percent. Why they do they care? Because, what are they? Because venture about? capital is all about asymmetry, and what you're doing is you're making small bets in areas where you can get in front of a big trend, whether it be cloud computing, whether it be blockchain technology. And we can spend, I mean, I love to spend time talking about this, is what people confuse 
is they think crypto is a thing. They think that, that you know, Bitcoin's a thing. And what they're missing is this is a technological evolution. That's what I wrote my last letter on, financial natural selection and Darwin. This is the evolution of technology. It started in the 50s, 1954 with the mainframe, 68 with the microchip, 82 with the personal computer, 96 with the internet, 2010 with the mobile net, and 2024, which is still five years from now, is the trust net. My term, use it liberally. And Tim, yeah. I want to call it the internet of things or the internet of value, but it's the trust net. We're using blockchain technology to establish a single point of truth or trust, and we don't need that intermediate trusted third party. And what it does is the same way DOS created an operating system for computers, personal computers, you know, and uh, Steve Ballmer, 1996 or 1982, going to work for Microsoft. His mom's like, no, 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 why would anyone want a computer in their house? He has 18 billion reasons to say, mom, I was right. So um, then in 2010, or actually in 2005, Google bought Android. People said, what are you doing buying Android? Well, now they have 80% market share globally of mobile phones, operating system. And so the same thing is going to happen here with blockchain. Over the next five, eight, 10 years, blockchain will drive every meaningful company, every meaningful network, every meaningful system on the planet. It is this technological wave that will give early investors huge multiples. This is the pitch. This is something like what you might have been saying in front of the board, potentially. Perfect example. In the board meeting, police board, okay? Two and a half hour board meeting. We're grilled every which way from Sunday, right? They had a 200 page due diligence questionnaire that we had to fill out. You know, Pomp tells the story, great. Like, I've never written 200 pages in my whole life about anything. And Pomp you guys, said that. Yeah, Pomp said that. And, you know, it's like I was operating out of a coffee shop. So I couldn't do a 200 page due diligence document. We already had it done. So that was why the institution trusts Morgan Creek. See, we want to be the trusted advisor to the digital age or in the digital age. We want to be somebody that institutions can trust because we come from the old world embracing the new world. And so we're at this board meeting, two and a half hours. We get to the very end and it's right out of central casting. Police officer, Harley parked outside, helmet, uniform, Helmet on the table, gun on the table, sunglasses, mustache, right off TV screen. And he says, all right, let me get this straight. Yeah, exactly. Let me get this straight. I got to go tell my guys that I just approved putting their pension in drug dealer money. I'm like, whoa, whoa, no, no, that is not what you're going to tell them. No, what you're going to tell them is this, that today as a fiduciary, you look at bonds and you're going to make 3% for the next 10 years. You look at equities, you're going to be lucky to make 3%. We have an actual assumed rate of seven and a half. The only way we're going to get that is by having diversifying assets that have a greater asymmetry to them, and that's venture capital. And venture capital in new technology that is going to use this emerging technology and make it mainstream. Because if you think about new technology, the first users are always the bad guys. Who is the first person with a pager? Drug dealer. Who's the first person with a cell phone? Drug dealer. Who's the first person to use the internet? Oh, Porn 100%. Industry. I mean, I have an uncle who worked in the telephone industry like in the 1980s, and he was telling me how like back then, and we, it was a conversation in, or, over Thanksgiving dinner where, you know, obviously I talk about what I write about, what I do, and how the industry, as you alluded to before, is associated with criminals, crooks, et cetera. Um, and he was saying, well, Frankie, back in, you know, the 80s when, uh, you know, Grandpa Bill and I were, uh, you know, working in the telephone industry, what we would do is we would sell... Actually, I honestly don't think I should say this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't I, know I was, where you're going, but no, they would basically they would configure the technology so that you could skip ahead calls. Of course, and so you skip ahead calls, and so everyone would look at you know telephones as in the beginning as this sort of shady thing, and I think every new technology has that. I have a question. So, um, when you're pitching mm -hmm. to these funds and to to other clients. Do you pitch this as a technological revolution or yeah. as a uh, monetary revolution? No, it's, it's fantastic. So um, yes and yes. So it, it is going to evolve even within the technology itself. And if you think about it today, we have the most successful blockchain is the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Most powerful supercomputer in the world, 15,000. 
1,500x more powerful than the next highest supercomputer, never had a fraudulent transaction, never had one second of downtime, bar none, most powerful computing system in the world. Okay, that's interesting, but what is it really good for? Well, right now, it's really a store of value. It's digital gold. Now, it's also being speculated in, but it really is digital gold. So that's a crypto commodity. And at the end of the day, there are only four assets that people can invest in, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities. Ultimately, we had analog, right, physical piece of paper. Then they went electronic, where we are today. We have QSIPs that represent analog physical piece of paper, DTCC. And eventually, we'll have digital. Crypto, another word for digital, just means cryptographically secure. So we have crypto commodities, right? Bitcoin is a crypto commodity. Now, people want it. Satoshi-san, theoretically, wanted it to be a cryptocurrency, a medium of exchange or a payment rail that will come. The challenge is in anything, it's like when you're building a house, good, fast, and cheap, pick two. You can have it good and fast, but it won't be cheap. You can have it good and cheap, but it won't be fast. You can have it fast and good, but it won't be, or fast and cheap, but it won't be good. So in technology, you can have fast or secure. Can't have both. So Bitcoin chose secure. So it's the most secure network, but it's not fast. So we're going to have to build second and third layer systems, just like Visa's not a pay, you know, it's not, not money. We use it like money every day. Everybody uses it, but it's a payment rail. And everyone says, oh, well, we can't compete. Bitcoin can't compete. Of course, not yet. Bitcoin's 10 years old. So, But it is an application of technology that will ultimately become a monetary revolution. And I have this great chart that I use in these presentations. If you go to like 5,000 years, gold has been money for 5,000 years, right? There have been 775 paper currencies in the history of mankind. Three quarters of them no longer exist, right? The Roman solidus, which wasn't paper, it was actually a copper coin, was the most powerful currency in the world for a millennia. Today, it's a trinket. I have one in my bag, right? It cost a dollar in, in um, Italy. But it, in fact, the word solid comes from that. If you had a solidus, you were a citizen, you mm -hmm. were solid. Now that's gone away because governments spend too much and they crash and empires fall and all that good stuff. That'll happen again in America. But it's another story for another day. But what happened is um, paper currencies have this uh, problem with being unsound money. Fiat currencies eventually fall. So for 5,000 years, one ounce of gold bought a fine man suit. In 1973, we left the gold standard, Nixon's you know calamity. And we, since then, have started the low or sl slow, long journey into calamity, which is the you know disappearance of the purchasing power of our currency. Same thing that happened in Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Argentina. All these things will happen because fiat is unsound money. So what I have is this great chart. It looks like a big X. And if you think about it, fiat started at 100% market share and it's going to zero. Crypto started at zero market share. It's going to 100. Not going to happen overnight but it's going to happen over time and cryptocurrency will replace fiat currency over the long term it will also become payment rails then ultimately we'll have crypto bonds crypto stocks that'll be digital representations of those ownership mm -hmm. assets and ultimately everything in the world but how do you convince investors are known to be a finicky bunch right yeah, yeah. how do you convince them along the ride like uh, you know, in my reporting over the course of 2018, I mean, there were LP lawsuits, there were funds shutting down, especially on the long tail. Hundred, you know, most of these guys just operating out of out of you know their garage or their mother's basement. But for a firm, an institutional type firm like yourself, when you're looking at something that sounds so long term, yep. something that's going to going to replace money, a new uh, system of of trust. Right. Yeah. How do you convince investors that this is worth their time over the next 10 years, especially when you have things like exchange hacks and you have things like, you know, network scalability issues, which Teo's diving into all the time. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, we're not seeing merchant adoption on the Bitcoin front. Education, education, education. Every technological advance takes longer than you think, has setbacks and things that people point at that say, it's not going to work, it's not going to happen. Okay, the internet. Paul Krugman said, it will never be more important than a fax machine. I'm thinking the internet's more important than a fax machine. And so so is, that, is that how you convince them? You just go to no, them and say, I mean, you can here's do that, what Paul Krugman said? No, look, it, it's, it's about education. So the first, the first hurdle is to get them to stop thinking about it 
as a thing, right? Don't think of it as a thing that your nephew did and told you about at Thanksgiving dinner and you put money in in 2017 and you lost a bunch, right? Because you speculated and you bought in at the price that was well above fair value and it went below fair value. Investing is a really simple concept, right? If you buy things below fair value and you hold them, you make money. If you buy things above fair value and you hold them, you lose money. It's pretty simple. And so people who bought crypto in the you know, herd of people in 2017, when Bitcoin was touching 20,000, lost a lot of money. And they rightfully don't trust it. Mm -hmm. But they were investing for all the wrong reasons. They didn't understand the technology. They didn't even understand it was technology. All they knew was it was something moving, it was shiny. And that's true of everything, internet stocks, pets.com, MySpace. I saw, I was doing my um, research for a presentation I'm doing. And there was a, there's actually a cover, don't mess with MySpace. MySpace is going to out Google Google and out PayPal PayPal. They're gone, right? They disappeared. So technology is going to have winners. It's going to have losers. And everyone has experienced that, particularly in the institutional world. They've all been through looking at a technology, whether through venture capital or private equity or private energy or other forms of private investing. And it's always a small piece of their portfolio. The bulk of people's wealth is always in the public markets. And the public markets, the problem with it is you got lots of volatility and you got now you got the machines and high frequency trading. And, and then you got people doing stupid ass stuff like, you know, uh, Long Island iced tea, turning themselves into Long Island blockchain. I was no, there for that. I, I was there for that IPO. That is when awesome. I was at NASDAQ. I remember awesome. drafting the press release for Long Island Block. Well, no, it was Long Island Iced Tea yeah. at the time. Yeah, Long Island Iced Tea. And here's a crazy thing. We had a company back in the, in the boom in 2000. So we had invested in the company that helped companies turn their name to dot-com. That's all they did. Okay? It went public. And our cost was 50 cents. The stock went public, traded to $104. Okay? Mm -hmm. We were restricted. Once we got off restriction, I called the, the venture capitalist and said, what should we do? He says, I can't talk because I'm an insider, but I can say two things. Revenue, $6 million. Market cap, $6 billion. And there was a silence. He said, Mark, did you hear? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 I got to go. Bye. Sell, 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 sell. And we sold around 100 Now it went to four. Now think about that. If your cost is 50 cents, four is still an eight bagger. That's still pretty good. But we made 200X. Because we got out. And, and the key is there are lots of those examples in institutional portfolios from a prudent allocation to venture capital, growth equity, or private investments. And so the same education process around this, it's convincing that police officer that we were doing a fiduciarily correct thing. And what he said was, I can support that. And in fact, he was quoted in an article where the reporters came in and said, what are you guys crazy investing in drug dealer money? So we're not investing in drug dealer money. We're making a prudent diversify, diversifying investment in our portfolio so that we can achieve our long-term actuary assumed rate and serve our beneficiaries. Would, would, uh, so, so you mentioned this sound money phenomenon. Yeah. Earlier, yeah, yeah. And uh, the loss of purchasing power. Um, would you say that um, you consider yourself an, an an Austrian economist, you fall into that category? Have you always um, fallen into that category? I, I, I probably lean that way. I'm not all in, but I, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely don't believe in voodoo economics, you know, like uh, supply side economics. I definitely um, probably have a, a little bit less of a leaning toward the monetarists. You know, I think inflation is not a monetary phenomenon. I think it's a, a demographic phenomenon. When you have a lot of young people, you have a lot of inflation. When you have a lot of old people, you have a lot of deflation. So I think from a monetary perspective, in terms of sound money, I'm definitely more of an Austrian. I think the gold standard was right in the sense that for 5,000 years, it has been pretty consistent. One ounce by the fine man we've also seen massive growth in GDP since the U.S. moved off the gold standard. Uh, well, I'll argue that has nothing to do with the gold standard and everything to do with demographics, right? Is the baby boomers started turning 45 and from 45 to 65, you're the most productive in your life. You spend the most. We also have a very good structure of fractional reserve banking, a very good system of fractional reserve banking and fractional reserve banking is the key. To me, it's, it's 
the expansion of credit through fractional reserve banking that is good. Now, you can do that with sound money. You don't have to devalue the currency to have fractional reserve banking. If you do both, arguably, you can juice the return. The problem is you get on this uh, um, uh, treadmill of if you don't continue to increase the liquidity and the uh, credit you're going to crash. And that's where we are today. That's why I had the president or the tweeter in chief telling us that the Fed must continue to cut rates. What do you think of uh, Herman Cain coming on board? Well, I, I guess I guess I have to like the fact that he said we should go back to the gold standard. So I guess I have to like that, but I don't like anything else about the guy. So so, so in order for, for Bitcoin to realize these uh, asymmetric returns- yeah. Does the dollar have to collapse? Do we have to see this ah, return to really great question? The economy? Uh, no, for for Bitcoin to have truly asymmetric returns, like the the fifty x hundred x returns that some people believe, and from I'm this not, point on, yeah, from this point on, oh yeah, no, no, no. yeah, from this point forward, sure. um, uh, I think what you have to have is network effect continue and and start to move out of. S curves are really interesting. So S curves, you start with the innovators, you know, the one or two percent. Then you go to the early adopters, and then you go to the late majority, and then or the early majority, then the late majority, then the early adopters, then the the masses. And you know, we're only at the very knee of the curve. You know, we're like 10, 11 percent adoption. So it's that exponential. And human beings are bad at math generally. Um, we're really bad at anything that's not linear. Like we can do linear math, two times two, four times four. But if you ask somebody 17 times 21, that's actually been proven to be the limit of human intelligence. People can't do that without a calculator. If you ask them to do squared or, you know, cubed or quad, they can't do it. So um, that's part of the challenge is people, there's a great quote from Bill Gates, right? You, you mentioned it earlier, Frank, in the sense that we always overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. And that's because people don't understand the compounding effect. And so for Bitcoin to really achieve, you know, I had this great tie that Van Eck gave me. It's got gold on one side and uh, Bitcoin on the other with a little scale for Bitcoin gold equivalents. And that's where I think the first step is, is mm -hmm. if, if gold is a seven and a half trillion dollar asset and Bitcoin gets there with 20 million coins or whatever, we got 17 million coins, we can get somewhere between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars per coin. And people say, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, no, it's not ridiculous. All we got to do is go to Satoshi's. And then the unit doesn't make people so freak out. Um, we can go to eight decimal places and make the per unit value pretty small. But a single coin, of which there aren't enough of every millionaire in the world, wanted one. Um, so we're going to end up with Satoshis anyway. So that demand, I think, has to come from organic growth and people saying, I want to use it. I want to use it for its convenience. But we need infrastructure. And that's why our first investment fund is all focused on infrastructure, We'll let other people who want to play in the speculating in the currency itself do that. And we have the Digital Asset Index Fund that we partnered with Bitwise to give an institutional quality. We want to be the S&P 500 of crypto. Why the S&P 500? Well, the S&P 500 is run by a committee. So we have a committee and they decide what goes in, what goes out. And there's a second criteria, which is it has to be things that aren't controlled by a single entity. So we kick out Stellar and, and XRP, not because we have anything against them, but because they're centrally controlled. Um, so we want that to become the S&P 500. There are lots of indices, but people trust the brand of the S&P 500. And so over time, we'd like people to have a, a portion of their assets in crypto itself. But right now we want exchanges, protocols, tools, infrastructure, data, all those things. But what are we going to see in the near term in terms of actual use cases rolling out? And, you know, there, there's a lot of talk that we're looking at at the block with, with decentralized finance and, you know, with synthetic derivatives and things like decentralized yeah. lending. Um, this idea that Bitcoin will replace or at least eat into what gold functions as seems like Something that's way down the line, maybe 10. Oh, I don't think it's way down the line at all. Ask any 35-year-old how much gold they have. Zero. Nada. Zip. Ask a 65-year-old how much Bitcoin they have. Zero. Nada. Zip. So you've got this divide across generations, 
And so I'm not saying that, that Bitcoin will replace gold. I think it's digital gold. The problem with gold, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Knight's Tale. It's one of my favorites. Oh, you got to watch it. Heath Ledger, classic. I'll do this it. This weekend, you got to watch it. Love this movie. Write it and down, Mike. It's all about jousting. And you know the, the, the main character goes around winning these jousting mm -hmm. tournaments and they always give him gold. And there's this one scene where he's got a gold calf and uh, he wants to give a piece to his um, uh, squire. And he literally bangs the calf and breaks off the leg and says, here, go do something with that. Yeah, That's a really inexact way to divide your gold. It's also heavy. Right? If you want to transport a lot of money across state yeah. lines, it's really hard to do. Um, whereas, you know, I say all the world's gold fits in two Olympic-sized swimming pools. All the Bitcoin in the world fits right here on my phone. Now, I don't have all of it in the world. In fact, I don't have any on my phone because I've been SIM swapped twice, which is ridiculous. And someone tried to steal your identity, right? I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I got, an Instagram, later, yeah, I got yeah. an Instagram uh, groupie or whatever. But uh, it's it's a crazy world that we live in. But well, I get it. So there, there is. I, I get the potential for for um, you know Bitcoin to replace gold in some aspects, yeah. especially among the younger folks. But what do you see happening very soon, more broadly throughout crypto? Okay, I think payment rails are already starting. I think you are starting to see people be willing to not just be a hodler, but to actually use it as a medium of exchange. Uh, I think that's that's positive. I think you will see more people. Uh, accept it. You know, I was in New Orleans, not for Mardi Gras because my wife didn't want to go then, but right before. And there were a couple of places in New Orleans that will accept Bitcoin for payment. Um, there's not a lot, but what we need is we need better wallets, right? We need better technology on our phones. We need uh, the ability to kind of segregate our, our hodling store of value stake and our payment piece where we don't care if we, we spend a little and get a little. Um, there's also... And we probably have to get more people like you, funds like you, comfortable with investing in this market. What are the headaches? I mean, when you think about allocating um, capital to this market, um, we, we talked about disclosures and such. You know, there's a legal uh, yep. hurdle. There's an education hurdle. Yep. But just from the reporting and, um, you know, you think of things like in the traditional Wall Street world, things like prime brokers that – Yes. that you know yep. extend leverage or rather yep. margin to all firms. of what that infrastructure. Missing? Well, we're missing everything. Right now, we're we're making progress. Right, we have we have companies like like BlockFi that are starting to make crypto loans. We've got um, you know infrastructure custodians that are starting to get qualified custody status that'll make the institutions happy. So we need all of these. Yeah, things. but it's like a trust from North Dakota. I understand. Look at and and you know Wyoming's right behind. Caitlin's doing great work in Wyoming, and now South Carolina is trying to copy what they've done. And copies, you know, it's good, slow. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. So we want to steal whatever we can get. And and look, we are still five years away from the point at which we deem this the next technological wave, right? So this is the cool time to invest, and. There's so much that's going to change and so much that's going to happen. And every, every piece of it is incremental and iterative. But what I love about it, and I say this all the time, that this is the greatest wealth creation opportunity I'm probably ever going to see in my lifetime. Why? Because when the internet came along, it was building on, pardon my French, although I said that once and someone said, why do you say that? We're not vulgar. So, you know, <laughs> it was built on crappy shit. The, the stuff that was in the technology world at that point was not very good, mm -hmm. right? Trying to do Netflix when it was first envisioned, video on demand, didn't work. Yeah. Because dial-up modems were too slow. And it almost died. I mean, Netflix almost died. And it wasn't until we got broadband and we kind of got that from the Koreans that um, we really started to see that opportunity. So the same thing has to happen is the technology of the internet enabled all of the things around information exchange. You know, in the old days, I sent a letter to somebody. Three days later, they got it. They sent, spent a day thinking about it. They wrote something down. Three days later, I got it. I got a response. Think about that. Seven days? Yeah. I joke, my wife can't wait seven seconds to get a response on a text. Usually how long it takes. Seven seconds to, or seven to days. To yeah, I'm, I'm with you. We're, we're, we're going to get along well. But the key is that that got even better when we went to mobile phones, the mobile net. Because... The internet had a few connected devices, personal computers. Now we have 10 billion 
cell phones. I don't know why we call them phones because no one talks on them, but supercomputers that we hold in our hand. There's 10 billion connected devices. Within five years, we'll have 200 billion connected devices. And that language, that operating system is blockchain. And it's going to drive payment between things. Think about it. You'll sit in your autonomous vehicle. You'll drive into the charging station. It'll instantaneously charge and you'll drive away. The car will make the payment to the charging station. You won't get out. I won't get out. We'll be in the back doing whatever we do, but the car will interact with the charging station or you'll walk into a store and you'll grab what you want. And the, the payment will happen between your cart or your wallet or whatever and the thing. It's already happening. It's already happening. Yeah. And, and so all these things are, are going to be developed. Mm -hmm. And the people who benefit the most are always the ones that embrace innovation as an asset class. Mm -hmm. and I said, there are four assets, stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. But I say there's a fifth asset, which is innovation. And you look at the best investors on the planet, whether it's you know, Yale or Notre Dame or UNC or some of the you know, good pension funds like Chris Ailman, it's uh, uh, um, Cal Sturz or some of the others. There are these leaders who always figured out that it's innovation that drives wealth creation. And this wealth creation opportunity is so much bigger. The internet created multi, multi-billion dollar companies, sent a billion dollar companies. The mobile net created the first trillion dollar companies with Apple and Amazon. This is going to create the first trillionaires. Let's, but let's, before let's, that happens, right? I mean, there's, it's still $200 billion market. There's still trillions of dollars of other assets floating around the world that you absolutely. as an investor need to be thinking about, need to be thinking about where the opportunity is. Um, we were watching the video of you on CNBC. You were calling for a disaster in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms still coming. of the stock market. Still coming. Best Q1, I think. What did Ryan say? Since the 80s. In terms of, well, we can get to- It's only a good Q1 your, because you had such a crappy Q4. But this well, is well, playing- Real quick no, no, though, before but, we get yeah. into what your, uh, what your crystal ball about the markets is saying- um, before that, I just want to know what you think about generally opportunities elsewhere outside of crypto as a fund, what do you look for or as a fund of funds yeah. and as a direct yeah. investor? So what our, opportunities do you look our for job is, outside of crypto? As an advisor is to have a view on every asset. So from stocks to bonds, to currencies, to commodities, to private markets, to public markets. And what's interesting is I would say it's just math, right? Hashtag just math. And every asset has an intrinsic value and it has the present value or current value. And that current value can be above or below the intrinsic value. And then it's either overvalued or undervalued. We like to buy undervalued things and sell overvalued things. Pretty simple. Now, the problem is things can become more overvalued. So let's, let's just walk through all the assets. So cash last year in 2018 outperformed 98% of global assets. How many people were overweight cash last year? No one. You guys were though, right? Yeah, well, we, we were overweight, but we weren't super overweight. Yeah. But, but think about that. Cash outperformed 98% of global assets. Now, all of, that underperform, or all of that outperformance happened in three months. So you were, you were underperforming for nine months until September 21st. That's when the bear market began in my mind. And since then, the next three months, you, you totally made it up and you actually went ahead for the year. So you fast forward and you say, like this year, you had a good first quarter in equities. Well, that's true, but it's only because you had such a crappy fourth quarter. Today, stocks are dead, US stocks, global stocks, dead money since January 26, 2017. I'm sorry, 2018. Since January 26, 2018. So 15 months, dead money, no return. So that's not a good outcome. I'm going to argue that it's going to stay that way for the next decade. We're going to have zero return in equities, public equities, for the next decade. Why do I say that? Because we're at similar valuations that we were in 2000. And from 2000 to 2010, we had zero return. Now, I think emerging markets will be exempt from that. There's good opportunities in emerging markets. And what you're seeing in, in many of those emerging markets are faster adoption of things related to crypto and other technologies mm -hmm. because they're just more technologically aware. I mean, I quote the stat all the time. In South Korea, for every engineer we graduate in the United States, they graduate 17. For every lawyer they graduate in South Korea, we graduate 40. So I joke, they're a country of wealth creation. We're a country of wealth redistribution. So 
Last year, or Fort last Lyons. year, last year okay. we graduated 450,000 STEM engineers. China graduated 4.5 million. They have 90% of the new patents on AI. They are killing us yeah. with new technology. Well, let's go back to let's go back to your thesis on. Go ahead. Yes, I, I had a question, which was also going back. So um, we were discussing innovation. Yeah, and. A lot of our conversation today has been focused around Bitcoin specifically. Bitcoin doesn't exist within a vacuum. What percentage probability do you assign to Bitcoin being the MySpace of the crypto market? Ah, well, okay. I, I thought I thought I knew where you're going, but I love it. I love the ending. Zero probability of being the MySpace because MySpace lost to uh, Facebook and others because. In a closed technology system, a company can come along with new technology and ace you out, right? Alta Vista, Lycos, Webcrawler were all much better um, search engines than Google. But then Google innovated in a closed system and outperformed all of them, became number one. In an open source world, post Red Hat, now anytime someone innovates and comes up with something new, copy paste. You can take that tech and add it to your chain. So- in the open source world, it's different. And so I think there's zero probability it becomes MySpace. Now, what's the problem? I thought you were going to ask, what's the probability that it is the long-term winner? And I actually think it's a reasonably high number. I won't put a number on it, but, but a big number. Why do I think that? It's because the guy who won the Nobel Prize this year, Paul Romer, I read a paper of his when I was in business school back in 87, and actually said at the time, I thought the guy would win the Nobel Prize. Now, it took 30 plus years for it to happen, but he did actually win the Nobel Prize. And he wrote this thing called the Law of Increasing Returns. And in that, what he talks about is not the best technology that wins, it's the technology that gets the greatest network effect the fastest. So VHS and beta, et cetera. And I think what Bitcoin has done, it was first, it has got the widest adoption and trust and therefore, I think it will be one of the long-term winners. Now, are there technological innovations that could occur that will do other things better? For sure. But what I also think is going to happen is Bitcoin is going to end up as a base layer. And then there'll be other layers like Lightning Network and other things on top of it. The same way that I have cash. Well, I actually don't have cash, but I used to have cash. And then I have cards and I use the cards the same way as cash. And now I have the, the Apple Pay, which is even different than the yeah. card because it's using my card, but it's a third layer s system. And so all those systems are going to emerge for crypto. And I think Bitcoin will be at the root of that. It may not be the only thing, but I think it'll be one of them. And um, that, that's very interesting. And when you're speaking to institutions and, and your peers in the investment world, where does Ethereum figure. Ah, great. Where do these other protocols figure? Yeah, I, I would say um, <laughs> it's a less uh, politically correct analogy these days after the Khashoggi murder. But uh, I say that that it's like Saudi, right? Bitcoin's the king and Ethereum's the crown prince. And then there's all the other princes that hate each other. And, you know, there's 6,000 Saudi princes. They all hate each other. Um, and really there's the king and the crown prince and that's all that matters. And so I think Ethereum is, is important. I think it is, you know, there's only 12 ish. I don't know what the exact number is cryptocurrencies. Everything else that's called cryptocurrency is not right. It's a utility token and some utility tokens are good. 90 plus percent of them are bad going to zero, but some of them are going to be amazing. But the cryptocurrency is store of value or medium exchange. There's only a small number, Monero, Dash, Ethereum, Bitcoin. I don't know, Bitcoin Th cash. That's interesting. How, how do you tend to distinguish between a utility token and a cryptocurrency. I, a I utility really token, it, to me, a utility token is just Chuck E. Cheese token. It gives you access to a network or some privilege like airline miles. Whereas a cryptocurrency to me has to be either a store of value or medium of exchange and doesn't do anything else. Whereas you can also have um, other types of digital assets that don't have any of those functions. I mean, one of the challenges of ICOs, you know, Pomp and Jason were really negative on ICOs. And when they said, we're not going to do any ICOs, people said, oh, you're idiots. And everybody else did ICO funds and they've all gone to zero, close enough. And the reality was that most of those ICOs were bad because they don't give you access to cash flow or ownership. If, if all I had, like if, if I issue the Mark coin and I give you guys all in this room coins, and then I take the money and I build out a string of buildings and, you know, 
call them Chuck E. Cheese, and then I give you the mark tokens and you go knock yourself out and have fun on the arcade, that's great for you. You get to play the games. But what you should have said is, I want 50% of your business. I want to own a piece of that business. So utility tokens, to me, were, were a great way to crowdsource venture capital. The problem is pre-seed stage venture has a 90 plus percent loss ratio. And why people are expecting it to be any better than that is silly. So cryptocurrency, I said a dozen or so, I don't know what the exact number is, really interesting, really good, and I think long-term winners. Ethereum is one of those. So just thinking about, um, you know, I want to ask this to everyone who comes on the show, what you might have been wrong about over the past three months and how you might have, in terms of your view of the market, crypto or otherwise, have shifted that view You were talking about how we're going to have in 2019, and we were about to get into it, um, a devastating year for the markets. Um, How is that still your view despite, you know, I mean, this is one of the best Q1s in, you know, many, many years. Um, How are you still of that view? What in the market are you seeing that the rest of the market isn't? Yeah, so lots of- You mentioned zombie companies. No, lots of things. So first of all, I'm wrong all the time, right? And, And I don't have any ego about it in that to be a great investor, you're actually wrong more than lousy investors because great investors actually are willing to put themselves out and take a stand and be wrong. Lousy investors never do anything. They're paralyzed. So they're never wrong, but they never make any money. The best investors in the history, right? Julian Robertson, George Soros, Michael Steinhardt, right? 58% of the time, you know, I aspire to be 50 something. Um, The key is to, when you're wrong, cut your losses. And when you're right, double up. Uh, most people double down and trim their winners. That's the wrong thing to do. So are you doubling so, down? So, okay, doubling no, so, wait a so, so you ask, why do I think we're still in a bear market? And why do I think 2019 is going to be a crappy year, even though first quarter was great? Because I think we are in a three-year period, just like 2000, 2001, 2002. And what people forget is in 2000, we had the tech bubble. We had crazy IPOs. 81% didn't make any money. We just eclipsed that record with the Lyft IPO, which we made a lot of money on, but that's 82% companies now don't make money. So we eclipsed that record. We got the highest number of companies without that don't make money going public. Your point about zombie companies, we have the highest percentage of companies we've ever had that actually, not only can they not pay off their debt, they can't service their debt with the last three years of EBIT. So 16% of companies in the S&P 1500, so the top 1500 companies in the United States, 16%, one in six, can't service their debt with the money they make. And one third, actually a little higher, 35% of all the companies in the Russell 2000 make no money. That's bad. And that's all because of QE and allowing bad things to exist in what I call participation trophy markets. So what I said was 2000 was going to play out. I mean, 2018 was going to play out like 2000. So we were basically flat to September. um, And then we, I mean, we're, well, we were up a little bit through September and then we crashed and we finished down single digits. So in 2000, we were down nine. In uh, uh, 2018, we were down four. So then what happened in 2001 is we had the last gasp rally return to normal. So you've ever seen the, the bubble chart? You got the new paradigm, then you get the crash, and then you get the last little run up that's called the return to normal before the big crash. And that's exactly what happened in 2001. We had a big run up in a 20% run up in uh, second quarter, between first and second quarter of 2001. And then starting in May, we went down 30%. We rallied another 20%. We had two 20% rallies in 2001, and we still finished down 14%. So I think that's exactly what's happening here. The plunge protection team came in. I was on TV on uh, Christmas Eve, and they asked, what do you think is going on? I was actually on a Christmas Eve, on the 26th, after Christmas Eve. And I was up in Chicago, and they said, what do you think is going on? I said, I think they called the plunge protection team, and I think the the crash is over. We're still only up 15% over. from the beginning of the year, so we could have another- Well, since September 21st last year, we're still down. Since September 21st last year, we're still down. Only down 1%, but we're still down. And so what people are missing is this is a normal way that a bear market works. And I described it on TV as it's like a rubber ball bouncing down a set of stairs. Each bounce is higher. That's just kinetic energy. The end of the trip is a bad place. So if I'm wrong on the bear market not playing out, what I will have missed is, here's the thing. First quarter earnings that were supposed to be double-digit growth three months ago 
are now going to be down single digits. It's the steepest drop in 30 years for first quarter earnings estimates. Pre-announcements by companies are over 77% negative. Haven't had that in 20 years. And I think the earnings season of first quarter is going to be absolutely god-awful. Uh, I think the only thing keeping the market up is buybacks. We had a, I thought the record was as good as it could get last year. So I believe that the uh, the government cut a deal with companies. The Fed is not allowed to buy stock directly. Bank of Japan can buy stock. Swiss National Bank can buy stock. The Fed is not allowed to buy stock. So what I believe they did is said, all right, look, we'll cut your taxes and you take that money and you buy back stock. And in so doing, you'll support the market. So $800 billion of buybacks last year shattered the all-time record by a factor of two. I thought we couldn't get higher than $200 billion in fourth quarter. $290 billion. We had outflows from mutual funds. We had outflows from ETFs. The only positive was buybacks. buybacks. And if you watch the market every day from about 11 o'clock in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon, it goes straight up 45 degree line. And what you want to watch is the first half hour. That's when the dumb money trades. That's when the retail money trades. And that's what you're going to try to buy. And if you watch the last half hour, that's when the smart money trades. And it's been distributing again. And by distribution means it's selling. So the last half hour is always weak. All last year, last half hour was weak. First quarter, last half hour was strong. That was the buybacks and the ETFs. And the, I'll say the plunge protection team. But here's the problem. Look at the volume. Look at Apple's volume in the last two weeks, minuscule. I think to Monday, we had the lowest volume day in the last 12 months. So it's not that lots of people are buying. It's that we have this short squeeze and buybacks, and that is artificially holding up. And when that dam breaks and people actually see how bad first quarter earnings are and how bad the growth numbers are, IMF just downgraded global growth for the mm -hmm. third time in six months but I could be wrong. And at, just to close up, because we, we're running out of time and there's people that are looking to kick us out. Is that good or bad for Bitcoin in one word? It's agnostic for Bitcoin. There are a lot of things that are good for Bitcoin. What's good for Bitcoin is price is a liar. Don't look at the daily price. Look at all of the fundamental things, growth in number of wallets, growth in transactions, transactions per block. All the fundamental metrics of Bitcoin are going positive. All the fundamentals of blockchain adoption and usage is positive. Focus on that. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thanks for having me. It was fun. We'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one in finance on the App Store for almost two years. It was the first major peer-to-peer -peer payments app to support Bitcoin. And it's still the fastest and easiest way to on-ramp fiat. No more waiting five days for your ACH transfer to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. When you're ready to take full ownership of your private keys, just use Cash App to scan an external wallet's QR code. It's really that simple. Cash App also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits and others your bank would never even consider, like Cash Card, a customizable debit card that lets you instantly save every time you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, Dunkin', local coffee shops, and a whole lot more. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play, and thanks for listening.